Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 63 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good, my friend. Same as always. Now, this is the last show we do of 2016. Last week's show, the Christmas special, which was also episode 62. Of course, we had the four-weight world champion, Nanito Denaire, on the show. We also had Gennady Golovkin's promoter, Tom Loeffler, and we also had the newly crowned WBA interim world champion, Hassan and Dam. So if you haven't given that a listen, you should definitely go back. It was a good show. It was pretty long, but it was a little... It was it was a little special, it really was. There was something about last week's show that I really, really enjoyed. So this week is the last show of 2016, as I said, so it's a New Year special. Now, we're going to start with the preview part of the show, which we always start with, to be honest, on this show, the Box Hard Podcast. So one or two fights to go over, not too many to review. We're going to start with a fight that happened over in the Lac Limi Casino in Gatineau, Quebec, Canada. Top of the bill over there, Arta Baturbiev. He was 10-0 and with 10 knockouts going into this fight. He took on Isidro Renoni Prieto, who had a record of 26-1 and with three draws. Um, well, you know, it was at light heavyweight. Artur Baturbiev, we know he's a knockout merchant. He made easy, easy work of his opponent. He took him out with a TKO in round one. Um, Prieto was down twice in that first round in total. And Baturbiev, just a complete demolition job. You know, as soon as he... He senses that you're hurt. He jumps in there for the kill. And, you know, every single time so far he's got it. So he's got some good names on his resume, even though he's only had 11 fights. But he's looking absolutely brilliant. He retained his WBA, NABA light heavyweight title. So he's now 11-0 and with 11 knockouts. And I cannot wait to see what his future holds. The light heavyweight division, not the most talent-packed division at the moment, I suppose. But it is very hot at the moment there's not when i say them not the most talent packed i mean obviously there's some elite fighters at light heavyweight but there's not like you know for example in divisions like welterweight there's so many contenders there's so many champions you just it's really a pick em who's the best but in the light heavyweight division there are some true elite fighters in that division and it's hotting up at the moment what I mean by that is we've got Andre Ward we've got Kovalev, we've got Adonis Stevenson Joe Smith Jr. definitely deserves a shout with the year that he's had and of course we've we've got Baturbiev who just looks like a wrecking machine at the moment so really all those guys have got a claim to be elite fighters so the future of the light heavyweight division is very very exciting um, also, you know, Nathan Cleverly doing things over there now. I'm not sure we can call him elite at the minute. We have to see what his future holds. But, you know, he's been a champion before. He's a champion again. So the light heavyweight division definitely, definitely hotting up. But that's really it for Canada. That fight was also on Box Nation, by the way. Uh, one fight to mention over in Mexico. A former victim of James DeGaulle. Rogelio Porky Medina, he moved to 37 wins with a KO in round two. Believe it or not, he actually fought James DeGaulle at super middleweight, of course, and this fight was at cruiserweight. So that was quite, you know, that, that really shocked me when I saw that. But he picks up his 37th career win, his opponent with a record of 13-4 and four going into that fight. Medina also carries seven losses now. Uh, that one was over in Mexico. That's it for Mexico. The last couple of fights now to mention, I think two more bills. One over in China, former victim of... Um, of Sergei Kovalev, a man that we just mentioned. Um, his opponent, well, his ex-opponent, was Ishmael Salak. I, I remember that he made easy work of Ishmael Salak, who was a good fighter, a good test, we all thought, before the fight started. He actually won a technical decision, which was in round nine. It was scheduled for ten. This one was at Cruiserweight as well, so Ishmael Salak's moved up, and he picks up his 25th career win here. And, uh, of course, he's got the three losses, and he picked up the vacant WBO 
Asia Pacific Cruiserweight title. He was actually cut above the right eyebrow due to an accidental headbutt which resulted in the fight being stopped ultimately. His opponent had a record of 14-4, and four, so good win there for Ishmael Salak over in China, that one. That's it for China. We're now going to go over to the final bill of the part one of the preview part, and then obviously we're going to get onto the news, but the final bill, top of the bill over in the Olympic Yard, Kiev, Ukraine, Andre Rudenko, former opponent of Huey Fury and uh, Lucas Brown, his record 30 and 2, the two losses. The, the two names that I just mentioned there, Lucas Brown and Huey Fury. He retained his WBC International Silver Heavyweight title against Jason Bergman, who had a record of 26 and 12 with two draws. This one was a unanimous decision win over 10 rounds for Rodenko. So the champion retains his title there. That's really it for the reviewing. We've whizzed for it pretty quick there. There's not too much fights on this period of the year. Ayaz, please bring in this week's news. Nick Blackwell has woken up from a coma as he continues to recover from the serious head injuries he suffered in the aspiring session last month. Yes, you know, again, I aired my opinions on this. Nick Blackwell should have not been sparring. He should know better than this, and so should the people that were involved in this particular, um, I don't know what we can call it, this particular... Uh, tragic event if you like but it's you know it's good to hear that he's woken up out of his coma and uh, hopefully he won't do this again or well, we don't we don't need to see uh, three times this happening now so he's been two times we don't need a third time unlucky here so uh, all the best to Nick Blackwell hopefully he you know he's a little bit cle- a bit, little bit more smarter with his choices in the future and putting his life in risk like he has done yep the second news is that Billy Joe Saunders could defend his WBO World Middleweight title against Saul Canelo Alvarez in 2017 after the Mexican was confirmed as his mandatory challenger. Yes, this is incredible. So, Saul Canelo Alvarez, of course, we've seen him. Um, well, there's been a lot of talk lately. You know, obviously, we all know about the Golovkin talk, and we're not really sure who's to blame in that fight not happening. It seemed like it was going to be Canelo's fault. Um, now we've seen Canelo go down to 154 and he beat Liam Smith, become the WBO champion there and he seems to have a pretty good relationship with the WBO all of a sudden and now if he goes up to middleweight, which it seems like he is, I, I guess he'll have to vacate his title, I don't think he's vacated his title at 154 but if he goes up to 160 he's going to be the mandatory challenger for Billy Joe's title so we've seen Frank Warren work with Canelo on the, you know, Canelo and his team and Golden Boy on the Liam Smith fight so I think that by the looks of things from the outside it seemed like the Frank Warren team and the Golden and boy Oscar De La Hoya's team seemed to get on very well in that promotion. It seemed like things went all to plan, all smoothly for both parties. So I can imagine that that fight will be pretty easy to make. However, um, on the last, you know, on the last performance by Billy Joe, it was it was a terrible performance from him. Despite he got the win in a very very close fight. So right now you definitely have to favour Canelo, uh, one sixty being a weight that I believe Canelo's pretty good at, to be honest. I want to see more of him at 160. I want to see him take on Golovkin at the end of the day. But we'll see what happens with him. There's also been a lot of talk that he's going up to 165 to fight um, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. at some sort of catch weight, which will be a real fight, you know, a real fantastic fight, a mega super fight over in Mexico. You know, two legends, if you like, in their own right. So, um, yeah, we, the, you know, the future is exciting for Canelo, whichever way he turns. Uh, yeah, that's really all I've got to say on that one, Ayaz, if there's any any more news or any opinion you want to add to that. Yeah, finally, Deontay Wilder will next defend his World Heavyweight Championship against Andres Warwick. It has been confirmed. Yes. Uh, which is the date for this one, Ayaz? Because I know that... Um, I think it's is it I think it's February sometime. It's it's yeah. obviously been confirmed this week. What's the date of it? It has been confirmed. The fight will happen in Alabama on February the twenty fifth. Yes, that was the date I believed it was, yeah, February twenty fifth. So um you know, it's good to see Deontay Wilder get out again. You know, he uh he well, he, he obviously picked up an injury in his last fight against Chris Ariola, so we weren't sure how long he was going to be out of the ring for. I remember after that fight, I think, was that the fight that Tyson Fury jumped in the ring and started? Uh, was that that fight? No, sure it, was it, was. The, it was the not that one. It was Arthur Spilker fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right, you're right. Your memory's better than mine. Yeah, so, you know, 
it, it wasn't overly impressive in the Ariola fight. You know, Ariola was terrible in that fight, and you know Deontay Wilder didn't really impress. But it was due to an injury, so he's been out the ring for a little while now. And you know, we like to see our champions pretty active. And you know, he has been active in recent years, but since becoming world champion, he's not been as active, which is you know very understandable. But he's fighting Warwick. I think that's how you say his name. You know, he's got a very, very padded record. It's a bit of an easy touch. It's it's a nice, you know, it's a nice um, scalp on on paper, I suppose. But you know, he's going to probably win this pretty easy. I see another knockout here. I think that uh, both men, being from Poland, Warwick and Spilka, I think that Spilka's the better fighter, to be honest. And Spilka pushed Ari, uh, not Ariola, Deontay Wilder, very close. So I think that this is another walk in the park win for Deontay Wilder. I know that. Um, a man that we're going to be speaking to in just a couple of moments also is not very happy with the whole Deontay Wilder, uh, you know, announcing that this is going to be his next opponent. I think he definitely would like to switch places with Warwick and get the fight himself. But uh, yeah, not many people very happy with that win. I think it's an easy win for Deontay Wilder. I, as I suppose you agree with me. Oh yes, definitely. This is a very easy win from him. I reckon, from my opinion, I'll knock him out within the net, within the first seven rounds. Yeah, I think maybe even I'll even go earlier, maybe the first three. I think as soon as he gets a, a little taste of the power, he's going to be looking for a way out. But, um, yeah, that's that's my opinions on that one. Is there any more news for us, Ayaz? No, that's it. Okay. Well, then, before we end part one, we're kind of whizzing through this a little bit, but before we end part one, there's one last thing to do. We recorded this interview um, about two or three hours before we started recording the show, so um, the audio is not the best. It wasn't our fault. It was simply because our guest was speaking to us via a laptop, so... Um, the, the sound wasn't the best, so I apologise in advance. You should still be able to hear everything, but if there is, if it does become a little bit muffled, I just want to apologise in advance for that. So there's one last thing to do before we end part one, and that, of course, is to welcome our first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man that's ranked highly in all of the sanctioning bodies, a man that is unbeaten in 19 contests with 16 knockouts. It's, of course, the big baby, Jarrell Miller. Jarrell, welcome to the show. What's up, what's up, what's up? How you guys doing today? Big baby in the house, Brooklyn. Hey, it's our pleasure, man. All good here. Now, I want to just... I know that we haven't got too long with you. I want to just um, talk about one little thing that I read online. Um, the, 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 the reason what got you into... Uh, you know, martial arts in the first place. There, you had an altercation in the street. Could you go into that just briefly for a couple of seconds? I mean, yeah. I mean, um, I got jumped when I was uh, in junior high school about a group of like six or seven, eight guys. And, you know, uh, soon after that, I wanted to learn how to really fight. So I started taking um, local, like, boxing lessons. But I was playing football at the same time. And I ended up actually stop taking the boxing lessons and uh, continue to play football. It wasn't until later on around before the summertime and um, I had came back from Canada and someone stole my bicycle. So my part of town was a little more rough than the other side of town where, you know, more, more so little Caucasian kids lived there. So, you know, the bad boys, us, used to go to the other side of the steal, steal other guy's bicycle. So I went to the other side of town and went to go take a bicycle. And on the way, riding back home to my side of town, I seen this beautiful lady in the window, like blonde hair, you know, the racks and all that. And I walked up I walked up in the gym like, yo, what do you guys do here? And she's like, you know, we're 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 a kickboxing school and she was standing up in the window, putting up a tarp. And she's like, yo, if you want to come back and check the venue while, you know, you're more than more than happy to come. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I ended up riding my bike on the side of town again back home. Right and I asked my mom, I'm like, hey, can I go see these kickboxing fights? She's like, okay, you know, just behave yourself. You know, not knowing I took this bicycle like an hour ago. Rode to the other side of town, and when I got there, um, you know, she let me back in and put me, like, front row. And I seen this uh, little Indian kid from, like, Trinidad, you know, must has been, like, 75 pounds soaking wet. One of my good friends to this day. And he fought another kid from Morocco. And I think he's about 125 pounds. Bigger kid than him. And he had to beat the crap out of this kid. And I was like, man, if he can do this, I know I can do this. So that kind of spoke my interest back in the training, man. And I, and I begged my mom for about two weeks to join the gym. It was a uh, Muay Thai kickboxing uh, on the extreme lacoste style there. And, um, man, I, as soon as I got back in it, man, I never left. Excellent, man. Thank you for the little backstory there. Thank you for the little backstory there. So obviously, you know, you've taken up professional boxing. Now you're doing very well in that. Mm -hmm. um, 
obviously, you know, last time out you beat Fred Cassie, who's regarded as a tough guy and he's very awkward as well. You made him quit at the end of round three. So a good win for you in that one. You've had three fights this year, all in which you've won them by stoppage. So it's been a good year for yourself. Now, it seems like in 2017, you desperately have got your eyes on some guys on my side of the water. I know you've had a lot to say about the likes of Huey Fury, David Price, you've said some things about Joshua, uh, Tyson Fury, although he's on a bit of a hiatus right now. We don't really know what's going on with him. Firstly, who who out of those bunch do you want in the ring uh, the most? You know, is it just I mean, is it just uh, a business set, you know, a business kind of thing here, or is it anything personal? Uh, I mean, first, it's, it's, a, it's a combination thing: business, person, and being a being a warrior. You know, what I mean, my main thing: I'm going for the big fish. It was Tyson Fury at first, but now. Uh, AJ's kind of fit fulfill that spot for the English fighters, and I, I want to rip his head off. Man, it's that simple. You know what I mean? I'm tired of these American so-called fighters going over there and just, you know, laying down. You know, and these guys are thinking that all American fighters are like that. You know what I mean? The heavyweight division was great because of the American heavyweights. You know what I'm trying to say? And they got to realize that, you know, a lot of these dudes that they're fighting are, are part-time fighters. You know what I mean? They failed in football, failed in basketball, failed in some other sport, and then came over, transitioned over to boxing. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I've been fighting since I was 14, and I'm 28 now. So they got to understand, if you check my resume, I'm a fighter. I'm a damn good one. I'm coming to rip somebody's head off. So for them to put all the American fighters in one pot, because the last couple C-minus fighters that they took over to England just quit or took a paycheck, is, is you know, it, it's absurd. I get it. But like you understand, Anthony Joshua's taking uh, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the small pups of the, uh, uh, of the litter. You know what I mean? But I can't blame him either. Deontay Watt's been doing it for a minute while he got the release belt. I mean, he's fighting guys we never even heard of. Look who he just picked up to fight now. You know what I mean? So, I mean, these guys are all trying to hold on to the belt. Nobody wanna, really want to fight nobody. Anthony Joshua's going to fight Vlad Kitschko. I think will still be a good fight. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no remedy for chin. You know, all these guys are, 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 are um, lack of chin. And as soon as one of them get touched, boy, you're going to see who really going to be able to stand up with some real power. I did want to ask you about that fight, um, Vladimir Klitschko and, and, and Anthony Joshua. Obviously, over here, you know, there's there's a load of people that think that Joshua is the best thing since sliced bread, but then there's a load of other guys who who um, who think that, you know, he, he has been cherry-picking a little bit. And, I mean, he's had to fight who he's had to fight, let's, 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 let's be honest. But he's got this, this Klitschko fight, and it seems like it is going to be his real um, first big test. So we're all, we're all happy that he's took the fight. How do you see that fight playing out? Who do you see winning that one, big baby? I mean, um, Vladimir has one of the best jabs that I've, I've seen and felt. You know what I mean? So if Vladimir does what he usually does, he's sticking that hard jab to the face and then sitting up with the right hand, then it's going to be early night for, uh, for, uh, for Anthony, you know what I mean, for, for Joshua, because... His right hand, if he gets hit on chin flush, and Dylan White hit him with a slap, you know what I mean? I mean, the, the sophisticated is going to go down. Um, if Vladimir comes in old and slow like he did against Tyson Fury, then Anthony Joshua is going to jump all over him, and there's going to be a retirement party for Vladimir Kitschko. But like I said before, uh, you know, Vladimir is coming for redemption. Uh, I think I think he gets motivated by the fighters, you know what I mean? Like when David Haig was talking all that smack for a couple of years, it motivated him to train harder and be his best. And he put the pressure on. So, um, you know, he's a champ. Nothing I can really say for him. If you lose, you lose. You win, you win, you know. He's been there, done that before I, before I even turned pro. If AJ uh, wins, you know, he moves closer. He gets, he gets up there and he finally have a notable, real notable win under his belt. And if he loses, you know, it is what it is. You know what I mean? Going to the next guy. Um, but like I said before, it's a matter of time before they run into Big Baby and I'm going to break him. And obviously, you know, in your last fight, I don't, mm. don't want to be critical or whatever, but you came in at your career heaviest. That's, mm. that's a well-known thing now. If you yeah. were to land, if you were if you were to land one of these fights over over here, um, right. you know, I take it that you'd know this as well. You'd obviously have to come in a lot, a lot, a lot lighter. What mm. was the reason why you came in so heavy for your last fight? You gotta understand. Every every fight, I kind of adjust my weight to depending on who, the, who I'm fighting. Um, if a guy's more, if he moves a lot. I kind of put more weight on because of the pressure. I want to lean on them. I want to hurt them. I want to break them down. Like you know what I'm saying, I broke, I broke Fred Cassidy down with a couple of body shots and just putting the pressure on them. So every fight, it, it varies depending on my weight and how I feel and how camp goes. So camp going very well. Like I said, I do six minute miles at two eighty something, two ninety something plus. So people, people, when they see that, like, wow, this guy's really an athlete, you know. So my drills are are are, are different than average athletes. So I'm trying to say, um, I'm naturally a big guy, naturally a big dude. You know what I mean? 
uh, at six four. I mean, the heck has ever been in three fifteen. I don't plan on going back there, but I'm just a naturally big guy. But some of these guys are not naturally big. You know, what I mean, the only person I can actually hold his weight at a, a, a reasonable size, which is based off of his, his bone structure, Beyonce Wilder. You know, he's never gone really over two thirty two per se. Walking up by maybe two twenty five, two thirty seven, or whatever when he trained. But um, you know, like you look at Andrew Jackson, uh, you know, when he's amateur at two twenty something, now all of a sudden, two years later, he's more ripped and more cut than he ever was at two forty and now going to fifty. Um, but I want the, I want the English. I know that I know there's a lot of sports in America. We have a lot of different sports: boxing, football, soccer, tennis, hockey. Where the hell America like we do so much? You know, boxing kind of like took like a back seat because we don't have the real stars now. Mayweather kind of out of the picture. And I know England. They have you have um. Soccer, you have boxing, and maybe cricket and rugby. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they have somebody looking for in a boxing game, but I want the real, I want the fan, even the new fan. I want you guys to study the sport of boxing. Study these fighters, study their past. Study what makes them really want to be a fighter. Study, study, their, study their character. Study, you know what I mean? Just study them. If you really want to be a boxing, a true boxing fan or fanatic, study the sport, man. Don't watch one or two fights and then jump on the bandwagon and you know, you think this guy's the great, like you said, the greatest in sliced bread. And um, I mean, for you guys, just tell the fans, man, just study the sport and really get behind fighters that really are fighters. You know what I mean? And and the real deal. You know, real role models. I mean, real models. You know, not role models. You, if you want a role model, there's a bunch of role models out here. The question is when when you hit when you hit them on camera, and some of these guys get caught for smoking weed, y'all get mad because the kid looked up to them. The question is, if you do your research on who your kids look up to, you wouldn't be surprised. Sometimes I say so. I tell everybody the same thing, man. Uh, you know, be sure the people you look up to. Yeah, I have to agree with you 100%. 100%. And um, when would you be ready to come over here? Um, obviously, you know, there's there's a major time difference. To come mm. over here and fight one of the top guys over here. As I said, you know, you've got Price, you've got Joshua, you've got Huey Fury, Tyson Fury. Mm. When would you be ready? When's the soonest you'd be ready next year? Man, I'd be ready by January, February, man. I'm ready to rock and roll. You know what I mean, you got to say, I'm a full brain warrior. I'm going to have to kill and hurt something. And, but at, at the end of the day, you still got to understand, you know, boxing is a business. And so I'm trying to say, like, if somebody's ranked higher than me, I'll gladly fight them because I know it's going to bring me closer to a belt. At least he's in the top 10. But for me to go fight somebody that's in the top 20, you know what I mean? It don't make no sense. I got to fight someone that's going to get me closer to my goal. And vice versa, I called a lot of guys out when I was in the top 20. Nobody wanted to fight me. I'm a high risk, low reward fight. So I get it. But now I'm in that position. Position, give me somebody that's close to me, maybe a little behind me, but it's going to put my rankings up where it put me in a better position to fight for a title. So I'm trying to say, so if they are priced in the top 10, I don't know, I haven't seen his name lately, or the top 15 at least, let me know. Because if he is, and if, I, and if the sanction of the you knock him out, you won't get second and third place. Let's make the fight happen. You know what I mean? Dylan White lost that fight to Zor, to, to, Zor, to tell you the truth. But if they, if they tell me I'm knocking this behind out, it's going to put me mad to like I'm supposed to have already right now. Let's make it happen. But don't you can't give me somebody in the top thirty and tell me, oh, he's an English top fighter. Yeah, he might be top of England, but he's trash in the world. So what's the point of me fighting him if I knock him out? It's, it's another stiff I can beat up. So I want somebody's credibility. You know what I mean? So if if, if they're telling me that all of a sudden Huey Fee's back in the picture for a mandatory title shot, which he doesn't deserve, number one for selling the drug test, and number two for skipping on the four man title limiter when he was supposed to fight me and Joseph Parker was to fight Ruiz, and of course it's been me versus versus Parker, how all of a sudden he comes back in the picture now? You know what I mean, the fans got to speak up, the media got to speak up. You know what I mean? Without the fans, without the boxes first, and then with the fans behind us, there won't be no sport of boxing. And that's why so many people got to understand. And the last couple of things I got for you now before I let you go. Um, Jarrell, because obviously we haven't got too long this time, but we will definitely have to catch up again in the future for a little bit of a longer period. Um, who do you want, just in one sentence, who do you want out of all the guys over here? You know, heavyweight boxing at, at the minute in the UK is really on fire right now, um, perhaps yeah. more so even than the US, which is you yeah. know, a, a, not, not, not many times we've been able to say that in the past. So who do you yeah. want the most out of all of the guys over here? Oh, that question is easy. I want Anthony G. Shane Joshua. <laughs> you know, tell him stop posing for Playpoint and fight a real warrior. You know what I mean? But I guess he's going to fight Vladimir, so, you know, I give him the benefit of the doubt right now. But, uh, yeah, man, if I'm if I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to make a statement, I'm going for the biggest and the baddest who y'all think it is. You know what I mean? So and that's, how, that's how I see it. And you knock him out? Listen, I beat him up. I beat him up till he quit. That's how bad I'm going to beat him up. I'm going to knock him out early. I'm just going to beat him up so he never want to box again. So if you fight Anthony Joshua, he quits on his stool? 
I beat the brakes off him. I make him quit. That's how I'm telling you. Make okay. him quit. Drown <laughs> Okay, Jarrell. Right, listen, my friend, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. It really, really has. I hope you get the fights that you're looking for. You know, if you come over here, it'd be absolutely brilliant. Thank you for giving us a bit of your time today. And as I say, we'll catch up again in the near future for a little bit longer. Nice. Nice talking to you guys in England. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part is the preview part where we preview the fights that are coming up this weekend or this week. I'm sure that many people will know that by now. You know, this week, Japan is the place to go. There's so much going on over in Japan. So we're going to start with a fight happening over in Tokyo. Top of the bill, Naoa Inoue. Now, he's 11-0. He's putting his WBO World Super Flyweight title on the line against Kohi Kono. Now, Kono has a record of 32-9, and but he's no easy touch. He's got the one draw, but Inoue, you know, he looks absolutely unbelievable. He's a, he's a superstar in Japan. You know, the man is absolutely unbelievable. The things he's done in his short career already, 11-0, as I said, you know, he's, he's, he's really paving a legacy already and he's in this game to break records and he, he has been, you know, he's, he's, been a, he's been a fantastic fighter already. So all the best to Inoue, he's definitely one to look out for. If, if no one's heard of him, then, uh, which I, I'm not going I'm not, I'm not to say that just the hardcores have heard of him, you know, he's He's, he's, he's not a man that if you haven't heard of, then you're not suddenly a hardcore. You know, these Japanese fighters in these lower weight classes don't get a lot of recognition. But we're giving some to Inoue here. He's a class, class fighter, believe me. If you can watch some of his clips on YouTube, you definitely should. Also on that bill, Akira Yagashi, 24-5. and five. He puts his IBF World Light Flyweight title on the line against Witterwus Basapin, who has a record of 31 wins and 5 losses. So, a double double world title card this one over in Tokyo Japan now we're going to leave Japan we're going to go over to the Boom Fitness Center in Cincinnati Ohio USA Hank Lundy we had him on the show a couple of weeks ago his fight got pushed back two weeks so it's happening this week on the 30th of this month that of course is Friday so Hank Lundy 26 and 6 with the one draw this one's for the vacant UBF World Lightweight title so the Universal Boxing Federation not really a title that's considered as a you know genuine world title if you like he takes on John Delpadang we don't know too much about him he's 10 wins and one draw um, you know, this is a fight that we spoke about mainly a couple of weeks back. There's not too much to say. As I say, Hank Lundy really said the most about this fight. You know, the, the more accurate stuff than what we're going to say. But we don't really know too much about Depardang. We know a bit more about Hank Lundy. And we wish him all the best because he's a nice fella. So all the best to Hank Lundy over in Ohio. But that's it for Ohio. Now we're going to jump straight back to Japan. And this is why Japan is the place to be this week in the boxing world. This one's over in the Ota City. General Gymnasium. Now that is a name that I like. This one's in Tokyo as well. Top of the bill, Jezreel Corrales, 20 and 1. He takes on Takashi Uchima. Now Uchima has a record of 24 and 1. This one is for Corrales's WBA Super World Super Featherweight title. And Corrales is a good fighter. So is Takashi Uchiyama, to be honest. So this is definitely a bang up, but one that I would favor Corrales in. Uh, also on this card, because there's two double world title cards in Japan this weekend. Also on the card, fighting, well, defending his WBA World Light Flyweight title, Ryochi Taguchi, 25 and 2, with one draw. He takes on Carlos Canizales, who's 16 and 0, and he's definitely not one to be overlooked. So good fights happening in Japan this weekend. Definitely good fights. And there's another fight happening, this one over in Gifu, Japan, at the Memorial Center. Another bill here. Uh, this one's for the vacant WBO World Light Flyweight title. Moises Fuentes, 24 and 2, with one draw. He takes on Kosi Tanaka, the home fighter, who's 7 and 0. So a man here who's seven and zero fighting for the vacant WBO World Light Flyweight title. So we know that you know he's the home fighter, but he is the special fighter in this fight. He's the man who I believe is going to get the job done. And as I say, Japan absolutely owning it this week. 
you know, absolutely smashing it right now over in Japan. And also another fight card, believe it or not, that I've just seen. I didn't even realize this one's happening in Japan as well. This one's at the Shimuza Arena in Kyoto, Japan. So as I say, Japan, I think there's seven world title fights happening in, in Japan this weekend, which is absolutely phenomenal. This one, a man that I do know a lot about, Jonathan Guzman, 22-0 and with 22 knockouts. He's the guy that I was telling Nanito Denier about on last week's show. I was telling him about him, and he said he didn't even know him. So he said he was going to look him up after we got off the phone, and I really hope he did, because that's a fight that could end up happening. Uh, Jonathan Guzman, he's taking on Yukinori Aguni, who has a record of 18-1 and one with one draw. Now, Jonathan Guzman, for a super bantamweight, can seriously whack. He really can. He's always exciting to watch. Very, very heavy-handed. Good selection of shots. But, um, you know, mainly those shots, he can really find someone's chin. He's, 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 like, he's got like a lock-on kind of thing. He cannot miss your chin. When he goes hunting for it, he, he certainly lands when he wants to. So, Jonathan Guzman, a, a fighter really that we should, we should really be looking at in the pound-for-pound pound stakes at the moment. I think he is the real, real deal. But there's a lot more to come from him. And also on this bill for the WBA World Flyweight title, it's being contested on this one. The champion, Kazuto Ioka. 20 and 1 he takes on Yutana Kenensa who has a record of 15 and 0 so some great fights happening over in Japan I know some of those names probably haven't been pronounced properly but um, I, I hope I haven't bored anyone with, with the pronunciation and, and the fighters that you may never have heard of but these are fighters that you will have heard of in the coming years because these are all special fighters so very very well done to Japan for having 7 world title fights on this week over there alone and that is just absolutely phenomenal. So great stuff for Japan. And that really is it. That is all the previewing done. So we've jumped through the show as quick as we could. We've really tried to make it a short show. We've made it short. We've made it sweet. Um, you know, last week's show, it went on for quite a long time. I believe it was the longest show that we've ever done. It was a special show. It was a Christmas show. This one's the New Year show, the New Year special, episode 63. We're going for it a little bit quicker. We don't want to be as long-winded as last week's show. So there's one last thing to do before we end the show entirely, and that is to welcome our second and final guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former two-time light middleweight champion of the world, Cornelius Canine Bundridge. Canine, welcome to the show. Oh, 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 oh. What's happening, brother? You all right? Thanks for having yes, me. Yes, sir. Hey, it's my pleasure, my friend. It's my pleasure. Canine, first things first. You've been out of the ring for almost 16 months. Uh, last time out, you lost your IBF world title to Jamal Charlo. However, you're fighting again in just a number of days. Please tell me and the listeners about it. Oh yeah, I'm excited to be um home and homecoming. I'm gonna fight at home, man. It gets no better than fighting at home. In front of your fans, your peoples, your family. And I'm just excited, man. Next next Saturday, January seventh. It's on and popping. January seventh, okay. Have you got your opponent sorted out yet or, or nothing at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got some guy. He's from overseas. I I, I can't even call his name. You know he's from overseas though. Okay. No worries, no yeah. worries. Um, as I say, you've been out with a little layoff anyway. So, um, as I said, you're, it's approaching 16 months since you've been out of the ring. What have you been doing in that time, and why the long layoff? Uh, you know, man, you know, boxing can be dirty. You know, people want to sign you. You know, I've been offered fights at the last minute. I mean, you know, one thing about me, I, you know, I know the game. I've been boxing for a nice, a nice while now, a long time, so... I just make sure I make the right decisions. I don't just jump in there. I mean, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And at the same time, you got to make the best decisions for you and your family. So the decisions, you know, that people come with me with, you know, they haven't been good. I mean, the things that people come on, on the table with haven't been good. So, I, you know, I took a step back and just decided just to, you know, take care of myself, man, and, you know, work things out so when I get back in the ring, it'll be something good, man, you know, something that I would want. So, you know, it's just a whole bunch. Of, I've been doing a lot of things, man. It's a whole lot. As you can see, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in my zone right now. I'm so focused on this fight next week. So, you know, it's just a lot going on. But I'm happy to be back. And just like I said, I'm spending time with the family. Basically, that's it, really, spending time with the family and making sure I make the right decisions as far as my career. I was actually offered a world title eliminator fight maybe what, about six months ago. 
But, you know, the money wasn't right. The situation wasn't right. So that's one of the reasons why I had him back in the ring. I've been inactive. I want to ask you this because, as I say, you know, there's been a little layoff now. There's, we're not, I'm not clear on who the opponent is at this stage. So I want to ask you, um, you know, you, you've had a long career, as you said. You've been a pro now for, um, you know, over 20 years you've been a pro now. So who would you say, K-9, is the toughest fight that you've had in your career? Probably a couple of months back, about two or three months back, we actually had the man on that you dethroned for the world title, Carlos Molina. He was on our show. He's a nice fella. But who would you say is the toughest fight that you've been in, the toughest fighter that you've faced? I would say I probably would say it's probably um um Basagorov. I can't really pronounce his name. He's from Russia, but I fought him on a cliff going on the card. And even though I won the fight, I might have to say he was a toughest fight because this guy came, you know, he came with everything. I hit him with everything, and it, it took a while for me to take him out. But I took him out, and I was actually sharp in that fight. I was sharp. I was a hundred percent, and he still was tough. That was, I mean, but was it, that the there was that, a few of them out there, but I, w- I will say he he probably was the hardest fight. Was that the fight that took place over in Germany? Exactly, yeah. The fight, the fight right. I had over in Germany, yeah. You I would was, think... You, yeah, if, you, I go ahead, go ahead. You didn't have, if I remember correctly, you didn't have too much notice for that fight. Yeah, I had a short notice. Yeah, I had a short notice, but I had just fought a 10-round fight, so I was I was still sharp off the 10-round 10, 10 fight I had like a month ago. So that's why I didn't mind taking a short notice fight because I figured what well, I didn't do that last fight, I was going to do it in this fight. And that's what happened. I ended up stopping him. And that's how I got rated number two in the world in the men for Corey Spinks' IBS bill. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And yeah, obviously, yeah. over the years, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you've, you must have sparred some big names over the years, K9. Which type, which guys, which big name guys have you, have you sparred with? Have you, have you been in the ring with behind closed doors? Oh, uh, I've been in. I've been there with some of everybody. Um, um, Tommy Hearns, uh, Hector Camacho. I was fought with some a world champion as champion today. I sparred with Donna Stevenson. I was fought with um actually Tyson Fury, you know, former heavyweight champion in the world. Um, Obercar, who who fought Peter Shandad and Oscar De La Hoya, and and what he fought I Corte. I was fired with um, guys you probably not heard, you probably have heard of or haven't heard of, Marlon Trouble Man Thomas. He actually sparred Oscar De La Hoya to get Oscar De La Hoya ready. And Oscar De La Hoya didn't want that work. He sent him home from what I heard. And so I was fired with some I was fired with some killers, man. Yeah, you, yeah, have, yeah. you have. Some of those names surprising me. I've got to ask you now. Tyson Fury, how did that happen? He's about five <laughs> times your height. <laughs> hey, Tyson Fury, he was actually down in camp, you know, Man, you still used to bring him in, you know. He had that, that you know, Man, you still was one of the best trainers of all time, if not the best. And, you know, he was a good manager and all that. So he had always had fighters coming in and out. And he, and he, had, he always had fighters that wanted to, you know, be up under him because he knew his stuff. So that's, that's why I was able to fight spar against a lot of guys he would bring in. He actually would bring, especially at the original crunk, he would actually bring a guy in and then let them spar with me. And if they can pass the test with spar with me, then he would sign them. But if they didn't spar, if they didn't um, pass the test, he would send him home. I actually sparred a guy from Canada who uh, Maggie Stewart said, "Okay, wait, you know, go ahead, get, get in there with K nine, you know, go ahead and get K nine, you know, get spar with this man right here." I sparred a guy from Canada. I can't think of his name right now, but I put it on him, and Maggie sent him home. And right after that, he became world champion. So I said, you know, so it wasn't like I, you know, didn't know what I was doing. Even with the best of girls, I beat him, and he became world champion. I mean, so, you know, I, I might be one of the most underrated world champions of all time. Yeah, I have to agree, you are very underrated. But I've got to ask you again, Tyson Fury's about 8 foot 17. How, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, you was up to, you were like up to his knees. How did that happen? Uh, what, why did this happen? Oh, <laughs> uh, man, he just wanted to get in there with me. You know, Tyson Fury, you know, he a clown. He's silly, man. He, you know, the Tyson Fury that I know from Tyson Fury that the, the public see, it, it's like, I don't know if he's playing a game or what, but he's really a good dude. He's really a cool guy, you know. I was really surprised to see how, you know, how he would, how he was acting as far as in the media and all that. Because really, what I saw and him being around us, he was nowhere near like that. You know what I mean? He was a good Christian guy, from, you know, from what I saw when he was here. But um, you know, I don't know what's going on with him now. 
But um, man, you know, I don't think he was going all out. You know, the man like seven, seven one, six nine, and he's like what sixty, seventy pounds heavier than me. So of course I don't believe he was going all out. Just got in there with me and just fought with me. And I gave him a few rounds, and you know the rest was you know history. But um, it, you know it was good to be in there with him because you know I'm able to talk to you and tell you, hey, I was a world champion, heavyweight world champion before too. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff man good stuff and yeah you know Tyson Fury now he's a good guy I know um, you know I, I'm pretty close-ish with, with, with his family so uh, yeah he's a nice guy the whole family they're all good fellas to be honest it's not the, the media him he's not really the real him you know, people get the wrong side of the things they do this with, with a load of fighters you know Floyd uh, Adrian Broner as well you know they, they see the wrong side of these fighters but yeah, the less exactly. the better on that one. But brilliant stuff that you've sparred Tyson Fury. That's incredible. Now, as yeah. you're fast approaching 44, what yeah. still gives you the hunger to participate in this hard, hard sport? And what are your goals at this stage? Um, just probably just to end it on on a good note. You know, I I don't want to end on a bad note. That's why I'm you know kind of I, I can't I'm anticipating getting back in the ring. You know, you reached the, the last fight that I had because you know a lot of people they always say, man, hey man, I saw your last fight. You know, that's that's normally the fight that you didn't win if you if you lost it. So I'm trying to erase that. So they say I lost your last fight. I can say, I mean, they, they say I saw your last fight. I can say, no, you ain't see my last fight, man. Yes, I did, man. Man, you let that young guy like, no, I just fought the other day. Like you did, yeah. Oh, okay, all right. How you do? I took care of business. So I, you know, I just can't wait to get back in the ring. Just so you know, I can go forward. Like I said, I want to end it on a high note. Uh, maybe I'll fight a couple more years, you know. And I just feel like I got something left. I mean, you know, my reflexes are still there. Um, my heart is still there. Um, I love, I love boxing, and and it pays good too. <laughs> it pays good. But you know, I just, I just got to go into these fights, you know, real healthy because, you know, it's hard to beat the best fighters in the world. And you and you and you going in the fights with massive injuries. I mean, I'm talking about real, real, real injuries. I ain't talking about just no knickknacks. I mean, a lot of fighters going in fights with little injuries, but it's just like I be going in and fights with some serious big injuries, and then it's so hard to turn fights down when you only fight like once a year, you know. And so this this year, I, I, I plan on fighting at least four times this year, four to six times this year, if not more. I want to end on a high note and, and fight more because. That's that's really has tore my career kind of down to a certain extent, and I haven't had the best career that I could have had because of the inactivity. And like I say, it's just because you know you got to make the right decisions, man. People will come with you with some dumb stuff, man. You a lot of these promoters and managers, man, they something else, man. Trust me, I tell you, believe me. Yeah, no, no, I know, I know. So um, I'm I'm happy to hear you say that because when you said, oh, you know, I don't want to sort of go out as my last fight was a bad one I thought you were maybe just thinking about having one last fight whatever you know just a, a, a fight that you was going to win and that was going to be it but to hear you say that you're going to fight a few times I'm happy to hear you say that, that is good I'm, I'm happy that you genuinely do sound like you've got the hunger still in you which is brilliant so um, will your next fight be at 154 because you've been there your whole career yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I actually won up and, and I fought at 147 before too so what my goal would be is if I'm gonna actually finish on a real hot note, I would actually want to fight at one at 147. So I would fight a couple of fights, you know, a couple of fights at 154, and get used, to, you know, get used to being active, and then let my weight come down as I stay active. Kind of do like what Triple G is doing. Triple G, he's actually a big middleweight. The only way he's making middleweight is to fight all those times he's fighting, like fighting four, five, six times a year, is helping him to keep his weight down. So if I'm fighting four times, four to six times a year, I can fight well to weight. But if I'm only fighting once a year, then I won't be able to probably fight well to weight. Then I'm on a different kind of diet now too. So I just want to see what I can do at well to weight. You know, I give myself the best advantage at fighting well to weight with me only being five six or five seven versus me. If you saw my last fight before that guy six feet. And you know, these these junior middleweights, man, they're a lot bigger now. You look at Julian Williams, you look at Tony Harrison, you look at the um the other guy, I can't think of his name. Um uh, Herd, yeah, Herd, I think his name is Herd. These guys are giants now. So, you know, maybe I need to go ahead and take a step back and see what's what's going on at, at Welts Weight. 
You know, you got them key thurns out there, and he was fighting German away and came down. I know people might say, oh, well, he's in his 40s. It's going to be hard to do it. But, you know, with God, all things are possible. And I'm just going to see, you know, what, what boxing is going to take me in the next couple of years. Okay, well said. And at 154, which, you're, you know, you're currently at that weight, um, taking yourself out of the mix, who would you say is the number one man there out of, um, well, I suppose the, the, the top five or six guys you'd say would be uh, Lara, Andrade's in there as well, Demetrius Andrade, uh, both the Charlo brothers, and I guess Canelo would be in there as well. Who would you say is the, the number one man out of all those guys I just mentioned there, Kano? Oh, uh, I would say the hottest right now would be Charlo, Jamal Charlo, you know, with the last fight he's had, you know, fighting against an undefeated young, um, a young hungry fighter and Julian Williams. And it felt like he did, you know, and to, to beat me, whether whether I'm injured or not, to beat me, that's a big win. Then to go out there and beat Trout and Trout, you know, he just knew he had that fight. Like, he, he couldn't wait to fight um Jamal. So I would think that definitely the hottest right now would be would be Jamal. I mean, skill, skill-wise, you know, Laura could, Laura could be the top guy, but inactivity can kill anyone. Um, um... I got, I, you know, I got to keep my, I got to um, keep the three one three, um, Tony Harrison, you know, and we're gonna see what he does, you know, because he's gonna fight for a world title. I don't know if he's gonna fight Jamal. Jamal gonna move up or what? Um, the Cotos and the Canelos is really hard to say, you know, if they're the top guys. They got the top, they got the biggest names, but you just never know what they're gonna do. They go middleweight, the they go gym middleweight, they go here, they go there. I mean, you just don't know where they at and what they gonna do. So it's just real hard to say when it comes to those. So, I mean, at any given day, anybody can be anybody. But like I said, you know, the hottest probably right now would be, you know, Jamal. Um, uh, and Laura, he could be the best. Uh, Boo, 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 you know, he's he's been an actor. But I think if he was active, you know, he probably could be the best. I mean, it's a lot of them out there. It's a lot of them out there. It's a lot of them. Yeah, it's Jimmy is, 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 is very stacked. And Lubin guy, he's 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 moving up. You know, I heard he's been calling me out so much, and he would stop me in five rounds. But you know, that's all bark and, and not no bite. You know what I mean? All bark, no bite. But it's all good. But you know, much respect to the, to him. You know what I mean? A lot of young guys, they see you, you know, lose to another young guy, and they think that you're done. But uh, I've proved it before that you know I can take a licking and keep on ticking. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why I'm a two-time world champion. So I proved the first time wasn't a mistake. So I'm just pushing, trying to give me a third world title now. And I think it might be at welterweight. But who knows? We're going to see what happens. We're going to see what happens. But, um, you know, I'm just going to take care of my body. Um, keep God first. And I'm going to do a lot of fighting. <laughs> now, um, yeah, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. You know, Jamal's probably put together the, the best string of wins in, in, in the recent you know, eighteen months or so to to two years. Um, you know, he, he probably is the the hottest one at the moment in terms of momentum. Um, at at one forty seven, you mentioned that you you could perhaps challenge for a title there. I'm going to ask you about a fight that's taking place early in two thousand and seventeen. A fight where you could possibly be in that mix in the latter part of the, of the year. Um, how do you see the fight going between Danny Garcia and Keith Thurman? This is a real fight. That I'm probably the most okay. exciting fight for me of, of next year so far. Yeah, that 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 you know what that fight, that fight, man. You know, styles make fights. Uh, whoever can impose their style uh, will win the fight. I mean, you know, Keith Keith Thurman showed that he, you know he's a he's a better fighter than giving credit. You know, with the win he had over um, Sean Porter. Sean Porter's not only he's got to fight. And Danny Garcia, every time you count him out, you know, it seems like he knock you out. So that's a that, that that's a pick and fight, you know, it's a toss up fight. I mean, with the style, I think he doesn't got a style that he can actually beat anybody with the style he got because he can box, he can punch. And but Garcia, I mean, like I say, man, every time you count him out, you know, he win and he win in in, in style. Only times he didn't have he don't look kind of bad is when he went in there probably not as focused when he fought in Puerto Rico against um I can't recall the young brother's name. Mauricio Herrera. Yeah, Herrera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, we don't know if he got up for that fight or not. 
But when he's an underdog, oh, man. And I don't know if he's an underdog in this fight. But when he's an underdog, he fights better. So, I mean, and then, you know, I, I, I don't met, you know, Danny Garcia. I mean, Danny Garcia is kind of cool. But Thur- Thurman's a humble guy, so it's like, you really don't want to, you know, it seems like if you say one person, other person don't like you because you say other person. That's why I just say it's a toss of fight. You know, man, I just look forward to seeing it. But if I had to say who I thought would probably win, um, whew, I'll probably, I might, I'll probably would go with Thurman. Just because of the style. Just because of the style. And you got to remember, he coming from Jared Midway. He's, a, he's actually a bigger guy. He fought at Jared Midway and came down a world to it. Yeah, yeah, but if it's a close, it's a close, if it's a close fight, I mean, you know, I have to probably roll with Danny Garcia because you know, it's been fights that's been questionable that you know he doesn't get. You know, what I mean, he got a whole country behind him. You know, when you you got Mexican and Puerto Rican, you got a country behind you. You know what I mean? They will come. They will come from overseas to come see you fight. I don't saw a person, man, person, they um sold their car just <laughs> so no, not just their car, their wife's car just to come see one of their uh, fighters fight. I think that was um that was Kovalex, one of Kovalex fans. So, I mean, they some real die die hard fans, man. You know, for their for their peoples. You know, over here in America, man, we you know we ain't got it as good as the, the people from overseas. They try, they really actually support their fighters, man. I mean, they seriously do. If you go look at Deontay Wilder's Twitter, and you go look at Anthony Joshua's Twitter, Anthony Joshua has so many more followers than Deontay Wilder. And Deontay Wilder was champion before the, uh, Anthony Joshua, but it's just support. He has more support from from his country than America is supporting Deontay Wilder. And I don't I don't really get it. I feel like you know America is supposed to be the home of the brave, and it's supposed to be USA, and we're supposed to be so great and all this and that. And you just look, and you can just tell. Just look at in boxing. Just look at the numbers. You know, uh, like I say, Deontay Wilder, his, his numbers should be way up there. I mean, he's a heavyweight champion of the world and and it just doesn't make any sense that they, people are not supporting them especially American people are not supporting them like they you know like they should be but I, I support mm-hmm. them and the white people support them but man, you got just regular people over there Anthony Joshua got the little kids supporting them like yeah yeah they just they knock on the door you know Anthony Joshua's the champion of the world oh yes yeah yeah I'll follow him on Twitter okay alright <laughs> yeah yeah, so the social media world is is a hard one to understand. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. But it's but it's like that. No, I'm not trying to cut you off. But it's like that. Just period. Look at Amir Khan. You mean you would think the way Amir Khan seemed like he'd be begging for fights. You go look at his Twitter. He had over a million followers. Yeah, I think he has got a country behind him in, in Pakistan. That's what, seriously, you know, he's that, he's got a serious country behind him. That's but, what um, I'm talking about. Yeah, and obviously all those back-to-back fights that he was in, uh, he's done himself pretty good, I mean, I can't, to be honest. Um, K9, coming down to the last couple of questions now, um, I want to ask you, if you could make any fight, if you were if you were some kind of boxing promotion god where there was no politics, you could make any fight in world boxing right now, just one fight, because I know you probably you probably got about six or seven lined up. Which is which is the one fight you would make above all others? Well, when I when I got the world title the first time, I definitely would have made the fight with me and Mayweather, because Mayweather's from Michigan. I'm from Michigan. He's from Grand Rapids. I'm from Detroit, and I had the world title at the same time he had it, and I would have made that fight. That fight should have happened. It definitely should have happened, you know. But I remember meeting Floyd Mayweather one time. He was promoting a fight downtown Detroit against Oscar De La Hoya. And when I came in, I was just off the contender. I had just fought on that reality show called The Contender with Sylvester Long Sugar Leonard. And Floyd told me, K-9, I've seen the power. He said, well, Berto did the Bravo, he had your leftovers. So right then, I should have knew that he was gonna never, he was never going to fight me. Then when I saw him one time with Don King, I had just fought Corey Stinks and took his title. And I saw Floyd after the, after the fight. And I said, what up, Floyd? He just threw his hands up. So I said to myself, mm-hmm. So what was going on is that Don King had told Floyd, oh, man, I'm worried about it, man. As soon as, um, as, soon as um, Corey BK now, you going to fight Corey. So the fight was set up for Corey to fight fight Floyd. But then when I knocked, you know, when I stopped, Corey stinks. You know, I, you know, I put some salt in the game. So that's what Floyd was like, oh, man, it's a setup. 
That's why he shook his head like, oh, no, put my hands up. So I would I would have put that fight together. That's definitely one fight I would have put together. Um, Let me see. What fight would I have? Manny Pacquiao and Floyd. Manny Pacquiao and Floyd four or five, six years ago. Before, before Pacquiao had got stopped by Marquez, when everybody and their mama wanted to see that fight, I would have put that fight together four or five, six years ago. What I did that. Right now, in boxing right now. Oh, in boxing right now. Uh, I like the I like the I like the story about you and Floyd there. That 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 was interesting. I, I didn't want to jump in at all, but uh, <laughs> I initially meant right now. But I was liking what you were saying, so I was going to. Oh, okay. Oh right yeah, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you'd be surprised. Yeah. I got a story for days. Trust me. Um, you right now. Do something again in the future. We will definitely have to sit down for a bit longer and talk about something. <laughs> sure. Oh man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I've been around. Trust me, everybody. But um, let me see. Right now, well. Let's just say right before Andre Ward had fought, I would like to have seen a Donald Stevenson and um Kovalev fight. That would have been a fight I'd love, I'd love to see. I saw um um Lomacheco, Lomacheco and um Rigged Rigidal. That would be a fight I would like to see. If Rigidal can get active, if he can get active, I would like to see that fight. Uh, I would like to see Manny Pacquiao and Bronner. Manny Pacquiao and Bronner. Man, like yeah, it. at one forty, I'd like that at one forty. At forty, yeah, at one forty, at one forty, yeah. Or, or um, I, mean, I know it's probably not gonna happen, but um, what's some man names? Bradley, there you go. Bradley and Crawford, they best friends, so that ain't gonna happen. Bradley and Crawford, Ooh. or Bradley, Bradley and Bronner, Bradley oh. and Bronner. Canine, you're dropping them, man. You're dropping some wicked fights in here. Getting yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> oh man! Right, right, right. No, nah, but you oh, give yeah. me some brilliant fights. I, I want to see all of those fights. Hopefully, one of them at least does come off. One that I am excited for though is Joshua against Klitschko. I'm happy that's been made. By the way, that is one that I, that I uh, was looking forward yeah. to. Um, and you know what? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Ever since, ever since, no, no, I'm not trying to cut you off. Ever since he made the had passed though, and, and Jonathan Banks is a great trainer. You know, that's my boy. But you know, he, him, and Emmanuel Stewart. Chris Gordon Manning Stewart has such a buy. And, and since he Manning Stewart has passed, you know, a lot of fighters are calling Chris go out. Chris go, he don't, you know, he don't have, he, it ain't AIDS and caught up with him. It's just that he was so familiar with Emmanuel. And Manny was just such a, a great teacher. You know what I mean? He, he had your balance on point. He had your punches on point. Everything was on point. And Chris go was, you know, he's not on point like he was. If he was on, if Manny was still alive, what the man used to teach him, and what the man you even man you know how to even if you slow down, he know what to tell you how what to do. To, I mean, to, to actually fight against another guy, and um, yeah, I, I think it'd be uh, Joshua. Joshua would not be Anthony Joshua would not be fighting Clisco right now if the man was alive. And um, you know, I like Tyson Fury, but Tyson Fury wouldn't have beat Clisco if the man was alive right now. And like I say, man, and, and Clisco, he he's not over the hill. It just looks that way because. You know he he's working. He's not working with Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you know he he got some big fights left in him, but it's just that he him he missed Emmanuel badly. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know? no, it's a fair point. I mean, you know, I understand what you're saying. I mean, we've had uh, Jonathan Banks on the show a couple of times. Um, yeah. You know, he obviously knows his craft very well you know he's he's done his best to fill the shoes but he's so hard to when you know someone as good as as he that's is what I'm sure. he's, he's yeah that, he's um that's exactly he's what I'm talking about one of the best yeah I have to that, completely agree exactly yeah. exactly and I'm not yeah. saying Anthony, Anthony Joshua is not a good fighter he is but he he he's not he's not he wouldn't be ready for Clisco not right now he had to go through. He had to try to go through um, Deontay Wilder, and with that kind of experience, then he'd probably be ready for Klitschko. Because then Klitschko might have been slowed down by that time, you know. But um, you know, they get catching him at the right time. Same thing even with me. You know, when Emmanuel Stewart passed, you know, that's when I lost my title. You know what I mean? Emmanuel Stewart just he knew his stuff. You know, he de- and he was real good, even though he really never really trained me. Like he really didn't train me. He only gave me some task work like one time. But he, he was just a good motivator. Not only a good trainer, but he motivated me in my corner. Come on, man. You got to get this man. You got to get him. I remember when he told Jermaine Taylor, you know, get this man. You got to get Step your game up. <laughs> and he went out there and handled his business. You know, he, 
he knew his stuff. He knew his stuff, you know what I mean? And you know, definitely I wish he was still around, you know, but, you know, what can we do? He would be good for the sport, man. He that knowledge, you mean. Knowledge is just something else. HBO missed him real bad. I mean, you know, because some of the stuff people be saying nowadays, I'd be like, oh, man. Yep, man, he'd probably be rolling over in his grave. Like, what is they talking about? <laughs> you know? God rest his soul. But um, yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you do these? How do you do these voices so good? Like in one second, you don't even prepare. You just go warm. You done Don King perfectly. <laughs> man, I'm, I'm a character, man. I'm a character, you know. What about I like are, that? Are you good at the British? Are you good at a British accent or not? Oh, I, I no, no, I, just, I, I try. <laughs> I love yeah. your accent, though. Cheers, cheers, cheers. That, 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 that's, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. You have to. I had to talk to you. I had to talk to you actually uh, more than one time. You know, we talked on the phone like every day or for a whole week straight. Uh, man, you would think I was your cousin or your brother, or your twin or something. <laughs> hey, we're <laughs> right? born on. The, we, we 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 got the same birthdays, man. You never know. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You gotta stay in touch with me, man. We're 25th. Yeah, we're <laughs> 25th, man. Finally, yeah, the last two questions I got for you, my man. Um, I've got right. to ask you this because we have to ask this to everybody we speak to from overseas. I'm going to ask you who is your favorite UK fighter from past or present, any era? I have to ask you this because people get mad if I don't. Oh, man. I would have to say um, uh, Joe Kazaki. Yeah, he was a bad man. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was, that's, that's he was a bad man. Answer, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Five, five twelve, no joke either. Five twelve, no joke either. He was a lot. He was a lot better, better than giving credit for. I, I, I think a lot of young fighters over there, well, especially fighters in the past, I think they they are very underrated. They should be given more credit than what they're given. Now the fighters now over there, they get a lot more credit. I'm not saying I'm not, I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but a lot of them get more credit than. Uh, I'm not saying that is that they shouldn't get the credit. But they just do just a little something. They be like, ah, everybody scream and go crazy. You know what I mean? Because of the fan base. But those fighters, like in the past, like 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 Azaki and Crouching them. I mean, today, you know, even in today, I feel like they don't get enough credit for what they did. And who knows? Maybe maybe Kel Brook and maybe Tyson Fury and the rest of those some of those guys over there might not still get the credit they deserve it today. I guess because maybe. In America, you know, they do so much in America with boxing, you know what I mean? And, and I, I don't know, man, but boxing is something else, man. It's something else. I mean, we can go on for days. I know you don't got that much time, man, but we can definitely go on for days. But definitely, I'm thankful that, you know, you actually, you, I mean, you had me on the show, man. man. You know, I haven't had an interview in a minute, as you see. You know, I'm stuttering a little bit, you know. I ain't punch Trump and nothing. I still got some left just for anybody that's listening. The dog is coming. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the final oh, question man. for you now, K9. All right. Um, Christmas has gone past, obviously, but um, yeah. throughout the month of December, we've had to ask everybody that we've had on th this show, we've had to ask them, everybody we spoke to in December, we've had to ask them what was on their Christmas wish list for 2017. Obviously, we've passed Christmas, but I'm still going to ask you, what is on your wish list for 2017 in terms of boxing? Um, Man, that... Um... Maybe maybe they stop showing fights on the same day. I mean, you know, I, I, I love HBO and Showtime, but you know, you give you making me have to pick which fight to watch. You know, what I mean, of course, I'm gonna pick the fight that's the better fight to watch. But why have it on the same day? You, know, you look up on a Saturday, you got a big fight, you got a crop fight on on HBO. Then you be look over there, you got Danny Garcia fighting on on Showtime. I mean, can we all just get along? <laughs> I heard someone had said that before. We, we need to get along, man. I want to see. I want to see fighters. They come together, man, and you know, get a union or something, man. You know, and we speak up and we get along with each other more. You know, and and um, and we definitely, we definitely need a union, man. Because at the end of the boxing, a lot of fighters are, are homeless, and I, I'm the world champions now. I'm so walking down the street, you know, with no car, uh, no place to go. I mean, we. I, I wish. I hope we can get a union for some of these fighters, man, and. And, and you know, uh, what's that uh, retirement fund? Uh, maybe some classes to, to build and help the guys manage their money. Maybe you could take the IRS can take you know the taxes out their money right away. So people don't have these IRS problems at the end of their career. They get everything took. 
I mean, and I just want to fight it. I just want everybody to get along. The promoters, the managers, just us to all get along, man, because we need each other. We need we need a union just like the NFL, and then boxing will be a lot better. And and and, and, and Americans need to support their fighters like 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 the Europeans do their fighters. And that's, that's why I say it. we need to all get along, all of us. Absolutely, man. Well said. Okay, listen, K9, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. It really has. Congratulations on being the 25th world champion on the Box Hard podcast. Have a great oh, yeah. new year. We'll look out for your next fight, and no doubt we'll speak again very soon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't forget me. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. God bless you, man. And happy new year. Okay, now it's time to conclude episode 63 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. We've whizzed through the show as quick as we could with the talking parts this week. I just didn't want it to be as long-winded as last week. I tried to go through the talking parts as quick as we could. Sorry for any poor audio you may have experienced. I apologised in advance, and I'm apologising now as well. So sorry if you've experienced any poor audio. I'd like to thank our two guests on this week's show, Jarrell Big Baby Miller and of course Cornelius K9 Bundridge I hope Big Baby gets a big fight in this coming year I truly do and I hope that K9 we can get him back on the show as soon as possible because I had a great time speaking with him myself and I as will be back next week as always have a fantastic New Year's leave all of your perhaps sorrow and bad experiences inside of the year 2016 leave it there close the book in a couple of days time I wish you all a bright and prosperous 2017 I truly do remember you can reach out to us via via Twitter at Box Hard Podcast. Enjoy this freebie, enjoy your weekends, and we'll see you next week.